Welcome to Magic Mirror and our exploration of witches in fairy tales. There aren't witches in every single fairy tale, of course, and there aren't even bad fairies in every single fairy tale, but there are some wonderful stories that have the most magnificent uh, and difficult uh, women who our hero or heroine comes up against. And we'll be looking at several of these, starting with Snow White. You can see a little bit of the Disney production behind me. And working on through till we come to our fifth story, which will be Hansel and Gretel, where there are in a way two witches. And we, that gives us an insight into what is the power or the, um, the force that we're dealing with here that every human being has to deal with one way or another, which is shown in fairy tales in, in this particular way. If you look below uh, where you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see there's a link. And if you click on that link, you have access to our free guide to decoding fairy tales. And you're very welcome to uh, look at that. And, and I hope you find it useful and interesting. We're going to start, though, not with witches in fairy tales, but with difficult and challenging women in mythology, because it's clear that the processes that are described in mythology are similar to, uh, akin to, if, if not perhaps identical to, those that are dealt with in fairy tales. And in some ways, myths came first. And we can see what is going on in fairy tales maybe a bit clearer if we look at what is happening in myths. So we will move on to our review of myths and difficult women and witches. We will start our exploration of witches in fairy tales by considering some goddesses, because there's definitely been a flow of ideas from mythology into fairy tales, and some of the great uh, characters that we find in mythology have their reflections in fairy tales and have clearly influenced those who created the fairy tales out of their higher imagination. And let's start with the goddess Hera. I'm speaking to you from Crete in Greece and Hera is the name of the wife of Zeus, known as Juno in the Roman pantheon. And she was jealous of the fact that Zeus uh, chased other goddesses and nymphs and had children by them and she got particularly uh, irritated when one of these nymphs fell pregnant and produced Heracles and you can see that Heracles in the in the Greek form his name comes from Hera and she sent two snakes to destroy him which he as you probably know throttled um, as, a, as a baby because he was very strong and Hera is tricked actually into suckling Heracles and he becomes extremely strong. And throughout his life and his great labours, Hera is always against him. But he eventually becomes a demigod and, and with his own uh, star cluster in the sky and, and uh, is considered to have joined the gods from being a human or having a human start. And for that reason, we can see that Hera's resistance was absolutely crucial to the unfoldment of his soul powers in his spiritual journey. The second goddess we will consider who has influenced fairy tales is Circe. Her very name implies a circle and she is the uh, goddess, minor goddess, that is discovered by Odysseus on his return journey to Ithaca to be reunited with Penelope, his wife. And Circe would bewitch him and, and succeeds in bewitching those who come with him. And, and the idea of witches enchanting uh, and changing uh, people uh, occurs in fairy tales, just as it does in mythology. She is the daughter of the sun god Helios and a water nymph. And her island has a wonderful name, Aeaea, uh, which has no particular meaning in Greek, but uh, is, is like a primal sound. The important thing about Circe is that when Odysseus manages to uh, 
resist her and to resist her enchantments and to keep his cool in dealing with her, she then becomes extremely helpful to him and without her help he could, wouldn't be able to make the return journey, particularly to pass through the clashing rocks of Scylla and Charybdis. So, so she is crucial to him and in the same way in fairy tales we'll find that the the uh, witches that have come across sometimes will actually help the protagonist. So Baba Yaga, for example, in the Slavic tradition, is definitely a help to at least some who cross her path. Medea, from the east, helps Jason with his quest to regain the Golden Fleece. And that's a story we will talk about in detail at some time in the, in the future. But she is described as a sorceress and she understands medicaments, she understands the power of plants, and she may well be based on those women who were able to assist in healing uh, and maybe some of the darker arts around poisons and, and their, their use as well. She helps Jason and she marries him and returns with him westward back to Corinth where he proves unfaithful to her and she is so outraged by his unfaithfulness that with her fire-breathing dragons she destroys his wife, uh, her own children by him and Corinth before heading off to the east. And her story is interesting and, and worth exploring in detail, which is that she, in one of the versions of her story, she goes to Persia or back to Persia and can be seen as the mother of the Medes. And we have heard of the Medes when we talk about the Medes and the Persians goddess as well. No exploration of the origin of the idea of witches would be complete without considering the classical idea of the fates the concept of fate intervening in the, the lives of ordinary people comes right down to the current day. But if we go back in time, then the fates were considered as threefold, with uh, one spinning, one measuring, and one cutting the thread of life uh, and influencing the lot of those who fell under their jurisdiction, as it were. And sometimes they're very mean um, and will chase like the Irenies of, of uh, Greek mythology. And uh, the Sirens as well are, are seen as uh, close, closely associated with, with this idea. But in the medieval period uh, in Europe, we get pictures of fate standing on a stone, uh, a square stone, and holding a, a, a spindle with thread and we can see even in that picture a, a similarity to pictures of witches of, of the same time and the idea that a witch somehow could intervene in one's fate and affect uh, what one was the good luck or bad luck that one was having. So the three fates uh, can be seen as progenitors or, or um, forerunners of the threefold aspect, for example, of Baba Yaga, or in some stories when the protagonist has to go and deal with three separate problems, um, three separate challenges, dealing with each of these three aspects of fate. Finally, we should consider as an origin of our current idea of witches or the idea of witches that grew in the medieval period, uh, Hecate. Hecate who is a lunar goddess and uh, a goddess of the boundaries, a goddess of transitions from one state to another and particularly she's associated with the underworld and she accompanies Demeter um, when Demeter goes seeking her daughter Persephone who has been taken by the Pluto, the god of the underworld, or Hades. Um, so Hecate is, is a chthonic god, if one can use that phrase. In other words, she, she deals with the, um, the afterlife or the, the subconscious life, the deeper life that is hidden from everyday consciousness. 
and she is a guardian of that threshold and she is often portrayed as a threefold goddess as well. Once upon a time in midwinter, when the snowflakes were falling like feathers from heaven, a queen sat sewing at her window, which had a frame of black ebony wood. As she sewed she looked up at the snow and pricked her finger with her needle. Three drops of blood fell into the snow. The red on the white looked so beautiful that she thought to herself, if only I had a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as the wood in this frame. Soon afterward she had a little daughter who was as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as ebony wood, and therefore they called her, Little Snow White. And as soon as the child was born, the queen died. A year later the king took himself another wife. She was a beautiful woman, but she was proud and arrogant, and she could not stand it if anyone might surpass her in beauty. She had a magic mirror. Every morning she stood before it, looked at herself, and said, Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who in this land is fairest of all? To this the mirror answered, You, my queen, are fairest of all. The witch in Snow White is one that we know best because of the landmark Disney film that portrayed her so graphically. And when we read the Grimm story, we, we see um, some other wonderful details that maybe are not carried over into the film. The mother dies, as we have um, heard in a clip earlier, and the vain stepmother um, comes in to look after Snow White. And she has a magic mirror, but this magic mirror always tells the truth about beauty. Snow White is, we're told of the story, is seven years old at this time. And eventually, when she passes the age of seven, the mirror answers truthfully that Snow White is a thousand times more beautiful than the Queen. And we learn that hatred grew like a weed in the Queen's heart, and she gradually becomes yellow and green with envy. And she decides to do away with her stepdaughter and she calls in a huntsman who is to take her to the wood and cut out her lungs and her liver to prove that she is dead. But Snow White wins over his compassion and says that she would just flee into the wild wood where he knows she will be consumed anyway. So his task will be carried out and a Luckily, a, a wild, a young wild boar comes past um, at about this time and he takes the lungs and liver of this um, wild pig and Snow White goes off into the wild wood and, and to her adventures with the seven dwarfs. But the mirror cannot lie and Snow White uh, is uh, still a thousand times more beautiful than the Queen and the Queen learns that she's still alive. So she decides she has to go and do the deed and, and colours her face and uh, pretends that she is a peddler. And she goes offering things at the cottage where Snow White is. First laces that lace up Snow White so tightly she can't breathe. And then a poison comb that sends her into a coma, um, which uh, only when the comb is removed from her hair is, uh, is she able to come back to consciousness again? And then, of course, finally, the poisoned apple, which uh, leads her to a state close to death. Now, the grim tale ends in a grim way, like this. Snow White's godless stepmother was also invited to the feast, the feast that is going to celebrate the marriage of Snow White and the prince who has awoken her. After putting on her beautiful clothes, she stepped before her mirror and said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who in, the la in this land is fairest of all? And the mirror answered, You, my queen, are fair, it is true, but the young queen is a thousand times fairer than you. And the wicked woman uttered a curse, and she became so frightened, so frightened she didn't know what to do. At first she didn't want to go to the wedding, but she found no peace. She had to go and see the young queen. When she arrived, she recognised Snow White and terrorised. She could only stand there without moving. And then this is how the story ends. Then they put a pair of iron shoes into burning coals. 
They were brought forth with tongs and placed before her, and she was forced to step in the red-hot shoes and dance until she fell down dead. And so the story of Snow White comes to an end, and uh, so does the witch. And we will see a bit later what this might mean. The story of Snow White ends with the destruction of the Queen who has come to Snow White's wedding. And this is true in some fairy tales that the, the evil antagonist is destroyed. But it's not true in all, and, and we will see that in the next story that we'll look at, which is uh, the famous one of Sleeping Beauty. And the version we are drawing on here is the grim version, where there are 13 fairies, we are told, in the realm where the princess is born to the king, king and queen. And they want to celebrate the birth of the child who has been much uh, wanted and, and uh, looked forward to. And unfortunately, the king only has 12 golden plates. So when he invites the fairies, he leaves out the fairy who is renowned for being a bit crusty and, and difficult and just invites the other 12. Unfortunately, the, the cruel and spiteful fairy gets to hear about it, and she is the equivalent to a witch of this story. And after the feast, each fairy gives a gift up until the 11th fairy. And then the bad or spiteful fairy turns up, and she utters a curse, and she says that uh, the gift she is going to give is this, that when the princess is 15 years old, she will prick herself with a spindle and fall down dead. Now the 12th fairy, uh, who had not given her gift, wait, had waited, and she now comes forward and she says, although she cannot take the curse away, she can soften it. And so she changes the fate of the princess, that when she has pricked her finger on a spindle, then she will have a sleep for a hundred years. So the king and queen, to avoid this, this outcome at all, have all the spindles in the realm destroyed. But let's hear what happens on the 15th birthday of the princess. On the morning of her 15th birthday, the princess awoke early excited to be another year older. She was up so early in the morning that she realized everyone else still slept. The princess roamed through the halls trying to keep herself occupied until the rest of the castle awoke. She wandered about the whole place, looking at rooms and halls as she pleased, and at last she came to an old tower. She climbed the narrow winding staircase and reached a little door. A rusty key was sticking in the lock and when she turned it, the door flew open. In a little room sat an old woman with a spindle, busily spinning her flax. The old woman was so deaf that she had never heard the king's command that all spindles should be destroyed. Good morning granny, said the princess, what are you doing? I am spinning, said the old woman. What is the thing that whirls round so merrily? asked the princess and she took the spindle and tried to spin too. But she had scarcely touched the spindle when it pricked her finger. At that moment she fell upon the bed which was standing near and lay still in a deep sleep. Now it's interesting that the description says that the old woman was so deaf that she had not heard the king's command. Now in the film versions the uh, the woman, the elderly deaf woman up in the tower is the same as the wicked fairy, but that is not explicit in the story. Um, she's just described as being an old woman who was deaf and, and uh, is in the tower and has carried on using her spindle over the years. So Sleeping Beauty, after her hundred years, is again awakened with a kiss by a prince. And at the end of this story, there's no destruction of the 13th fairy. She remains fulfilling her role, whatever that is. And we must suppose that because she is a fairy, she is immortal.
In the third tale that we'll look at, the pattern is somewhat different. This is the story of Rapunzel, one of my my great favourites because of the um, amazing symbology in it and, and what it, it suggests and shows forth. Um, and in this story, there's a childless couple who live near a walled garden. And we learn in, in the grim version that the walled garden is owned by a sorceress, that is said right at, right at the beginning. And the poor woman um, who doesn't have a child sees that there is a bed of Rapunzel growing. Now, Rapunzel is a, um, a radish-like plant. And she desires it so very strongly uh, that she fears death if she doesn't get hold of it. So she persuades her husband that he must collect some for her. So he goes down at dusk and he climbs into the walled garden and steals some of the Rapunzel and makes his wife some salad, which she eats with great relish and enjoyment. But then all she wants is more and she's now desperate for it. And she again puts great pressure on her husband to go and collect it for her. And once more he climbs into the garden, but this time he is confronted by the sorceress and she uh, threatens him, as we will hear. How can you dare, she asked with an angry look, to climb into my garden like a thief, to steal my Rapunzel? You will pay for this. Oh, let mercy overall justice. I came to do this out of necessity. My wife saw your Rapunzel from our window and such a longing came over her that she would die if she did not get some to eat. The sorceress's anger abated somewhat and she said, If things are as you say, I will allow you to take as much Rapunzel as you want. But under one condition, you must give me the child that your wife will bring to the world. It will do well, and I will take care of it like a mother. So the sorceress takes the child at birth and at the age of 12, having raised her up until that point, she locks her in a tower that has no doorway and no stair, no stairway. And we learn that um, the hair that Rapunzel grows is uh, very long indeed. A few years later, a passing prince hears Rapunzel's beautiful voice. And this is most important. He comes to the tower at dusk and he calls out, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And she does so and he climbs up the hair just as the sorceress does and gains access to her chamber at the top. And they become very close and, and uh, fall in love with each other. But Rapunzel is very innocent and after the prince has made several visits, she comments about him to Frau Gerthel, who is the sorceress. And Frau Gerthel is very angry indeed and cuts all her hair off. And when the prince uh, returns, then um, she pushes him out the window and he loses his, his sight. When the story resolves in this story, like the Sleeping Beauty story, the sorceress is not destroyed, but her curse doesn't come true. So the prince has his sight restored and indeed he comes together with Rapunzel and their, their children. And of course they live happily ever after. In the Slavic tradition, there is a, another witch who again never gets destroyed in the story. She's represents some um, principle that, that will persist throughout time. And her name is Baba Yaga. And Baba is a, a word that uh, in the Slavic languages means uh, a fortune teller. And Yaga in its various versions of the Slavic languages uh, means a witch or an evil woman or even a fury like the Irenies of, of Greek stories, the um, women who pursue those who have gone astray. And sometimes she's represented as a, a single witch living deep in the forest 
And sometimes there are three versions of her, an older one, one of middle age, and then a younger one. And Ivan, because the, the heroes in Russian fairy tales are almost inevitably called Ivan. Ivan uh, has been known to have to go to Baba Yaga to get advice. So a bit like Circe uh, in the story of the Odyssey, which we mentioned at the beginning, um, once she is placated, then she can be the, the source of useful information. Now, there are some wonderful images that go with Baba Yaga. Uh, one is the spinning hut that she lives in that's on chicken legs, and the chicken legs keep it spinning round, and even to get entrance to the house is difficult. And then the spinning house uh, is protected by skulls on sticks, which at night time their eyes glow and illumine the forest around. And Baba Yaga is described as filling the house from one corner to another corner, her, her head at one corner, her legs at the other corners. And she, when she's out and about from the house, she rides in a metal mortar, like a pestle and mortar, where things are crushed. And she rides one of those and flies through the forest and uh, sometimes carrying a broom. And this may be linked to the idea of uh, witches being able to fly. Certainly she is able to. And the point about Baba Yaga is she can hinder. Um, she, she is definitely a threat uh, and very destructive, but she can also help. So she has this ambiguous nature. But if she occurs in a fairy tale, then, then she is likely to be, at least initially, a hindrance and a danger. In the final tale that we would consider, there really are uh, two witches in the sense there are two female characters who are evil in their intent and uh, their evil works out in different ways. And this is the wonderful story of Hansel and Gretel which has been um, turned into film and also into ballet. Um, and it starts with the, a woodcutter and his wife who have little food and are facing starvation. And the wife, not the stepmother in this case, but the wife suggests abandoning the children in the forest with the logic that if they keep the children, they will all die. But if they send the children into the forest, then at least the woodcutter and herself will be able to survive. And the children are taken twice into the forest, the first time because Hansel is clever um, and has overheard what was planned. They f find their way back to the house and the, the father is overjoyed to see them, but the mother again persuades the father that they should indeed go into the forest and collect wood and build a big fire and rest by the fire while uh, more wood has been collected. And this time they do not find their way back for reasons that if you know the story, you, you will remember because the uh, grains of bread that the Hansel has dropped to, to illumine his way back, the path back to their house, have been eaten by birds. And this story is interesting in the roles that are played at various points by birds. But just focusing on the question of the witch, Hansel and Gretel go further and further into the forest, now being thoroughly lost, and they come to a rather wonderful little house. And Hansel persuades his sister that uh, they should eat. They started walking again, but managed only to go deeper and deeper into the woods. If help did not come soon, they would perish. At midday they saw a little snow-white bird sitting on a branch. It sang so beautifully that they stopped to listen. When it was finished it stretched its wings and flew in front of them. They followed it until they came to a little house. The bird sat on the roof, and when they came closer, they saw that the little house was built entirely from bread, with a roof made of cake, and the windows were made of clear sugar. Let's help ourselves to a good meal, said Hansel. I'll eat a piece of the roof, and Gretel you eat from the window. That will be sweet. Hansel reached up and broke off a little of the roof to see how it tasted, 
while Gretel stood next to the window panes and was nibbling at them. Then a gentle voice called out from inside. Nibble, nibble, little mouse, who is nibbling at my house? The children answered, the wind, the wind, the heavenly child. They continued to eat, without being distracted. Hansel, who very much liked the taste of the roof, tore down another large piece, and Gretel poked out an entire round window pane. Suddenly the door opened, and a woman, as old as the hills and leaning on a crutch, came creeping out. Hansel and Gretel were so frightened that they dropped what they were holding in their hands. And the witch decides to fatten them up, um, and she's going to make a meal of them. And she shuts up little Hansel in a cage, but she is very short-sighted, and, and the more food she puts in, he, which he eats, which keeps him alive, uh, and she sends Gretel off to collect water and doesn't feed her, only gives her the shells of, of food to, uh, to sustain her. Uh, but Hansel maintains his cleverness, and instead of sticking his finger out as requested, which she wants to feel if he's getting fatter, he sticks out an old bone. And all the time she can't work out why with all the food she's giving him, he remains skinny and not worth eating. But after they've been there for four weeks, she decides that she's going to eat Gretel anyway. And she prepares the oven and she wants Gretel to uh, crawl into it to make sure that it's um, burning properly and, and hot enough. But Gretel, working out what's going to happen, tricks the short-sighted witch and uh, gets her to climb in to show her how to, to do it, how to get into the oven. And when the witch has shown how easy it is even for somebody of her size to get in, then Gretel pushes the witch inside, slams shut the iron door, and again we have this theme of iron occurring, she slams shut the iron door and the uh, witch, we are told, burn, is burnt to a horrible death. Now, the children still have the problem of how to find their way home, but they do. And they have, before leaving the witch's house, discovered many treasures. And they take these treasures back home with them. When they arrive, their father is overjoyed to see them. And we learn that their mother is dead. So in this story, both the evil women, um, the death of the one, the witch, has been paralleled by the death of the other. So there we have it, five witches in, in five different stories and each of them uh, behaving somewhat differently. And the point to be made here is, is they can't be interpreted in quite the same way in each story. And to illustrate what we mean by that, uh, we should take Snow White and Hansel and Gretel. So Snow White, which we looked at first, by the end, the beautiful queen, um, has been forced to wear red hot shoes and she, she could not avoid going to Snow White's wedding. She felt, she would learn the story, she felt compelled to go there. But when she arrives and is recognised, then she is forced to wear the red hot shoes and dance herself to death. And in Hansel and Gretel, uh, when they get back home, having dispatched the witch um, literally and metaphorically into the oven and gone through the transformation that that indicates, the alchemical transformation of fire in the iron, um, the iron stove that the, uh, the witch was going to make bread in, uh, when they've gone through that transformation, they get back and find that their mother, not their stepmother, their mother has also died. So that principle is now no, no longer playing a part. So in each case, we see of, of a child, um, in, in Snow White's case, we know she's around about seven years of age, seven to eight years of age, because we're told that. And in all the portrayals of Hansel and Gretel, they're clearly very young children. So there's something that those children overcome if they have normal development, um, normal psychological or spiritual development, there's something that they overcome. And uh, it's that that is being represented in those fairy tales. Whereas when we move on to Rapunzel, we find that Frau Gerthel uh, is not overcome. She, she deals with 
uh, Rapunzel and she deals with the prince who is so importune as to make his way up to her chamber and as you learn from the end of the story make her pregnant um, we learn that uh, she deals with that severely and she cuts off all the hair of Rapunzel and that indicates a, a, a change of relationship with what the hair symbolises, the golden hair reaching down to the ground which is a, a, a prototypal wisdom, a, a being in touch with the, the deep inner wisdom and Rapunzel has to learn to access that wisdom another way and she needs the prince to go through the trials he goes through before they're reunited at the end in order for them to live happily ever after. And those elements of the story are, are well worth reflecting on and we will come back to them in due course. But Frau Gerthel remains because she is a, a principal that, um, a principal in time, she, she arrives uh, in daylight, she's a principal in time and she is necessary for Rapunzel. Rapunzel uh, has to become detached from the wisdom that um, was natural wisdom that she had from birth and she has to learn it as part of her own power. And it can also be seen as mankind's journey, uh, the, the attachment to the wisdom of the golden age, which we remember as a sort of dream. Um, we remember it in myths, but we don't have direct access to it, or at least most of us don't. And we have to learn to approach it a different way. And similar principles are there in Sleeping Beauty and with Baba Yaga that the, the bad fairy in Sleeping Beauty is not vanquished. Um, she's modified her death, which is necessary uh, for the, the development of the princess um, because it's not a, a literal death, it's a death of a particular type of consciousness, is transmuted into sleep from which um, the princess can awake. And with Baba Yaga, uh, she is both um, rather like the goddess Hera, who we mentioned right at the very beginning. Um, she is a, um, a perpetual or maybe even an eternal principle, uh, but she, uh, she will be always antagonistic unless she decides to be helpful. And she may be seen as representing very much natural, instinctive, understanding that the hunch, the, the, um, the insight that comes unbidden, uh, but has to be transformed into something that is more under the rule of an intuitive reason than is part of something that anybody going to her, Ivan in this case, is able to access. Can I remind you that underneath this video there is a link and it is a link to a free pamphlet which is a guide to how to decode fairy tales and you're, you're very welcome to it. Please uh, click on it and, and download it at your leisure. You'll find it very helpful for understanding new fairy tales. And please subscribe to this channel because we'll be posting more videos like this.